April 29th through May 5th of Morning and Evening Daily Readings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Morning and Evening Daily Readings by Charles Spurgeon. Morning, April 29th. Thou art my hope in the day of evil. Jeremiah 17, verse 17. The path of the Christian is not always bright with sunshine. He has his seasons of darkness and of storm. True, it is written in God's word, Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. And it is a great truth that religion is calculated to give a man happiness below as well as bliss above but experience tells us that if the course of the just be as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day yet sometimes that light is eclipsed at certain periods clouds cover the believer's sun and he walks in darkness and sees no light there are many who have rejoiced in the presence of god for a season they have basked in the sunshine in the earlier stages of their christian career they have walked along the green pastures by the side of the still waters but suddenly they find the glorious sky is clouded instead of the land of goshen they have to tread the sandy desert in the place of sweet waters they find troubled streams bitter to their taste and they say surely if i were a child of god this would not happen oh say not so thou who art walking in darkness the best of god's saints must drink the wormwood the dearest of his children must bear the cross no christian has enjoyed perpetual prosperity no believer can always keep his harp from the willows perhaps the lord allotted you at first a smooth and unclouded path because you were weak and timid he tempered the wind to the shorn lamb but now that you are stronger in the spiritual life you must enter upon the riper and rougher experience of god's full-grown children we need winds and tempests to exercise our faith to tear off the rotten bough of self-dependence and to root us more firmly in christ the day of evil reveals to us the value of our glorious hope evening april twenty ninth the lord taketh pleasure in his people psalm 149 verse 4 how comprehensive is the love of jesus there is no part of his people's interests which he does not consider and there is nothing which concerns their welfare which is not important to him not merely does he think of you believer as an immortal being but as a mortal being too do not deny it or doubt it the very hairs on your head are all numbered the steps of a good man are ordered by the lord and he delighteth in his way it were a sad thing for us if this mantle of love did not cover all our concerns for what mischief might be wrought to us in that part of our busyness which did not come under our gracious lord's inspection believer rest assured that the heart of jesus cares about your meaner affairs the breath of his tender love is such that you may resort to him in all matters for in all your afflictions he is afflicted and like as a father pitieth his children so doth he pity you the meanest interests of all his saints are all borne upon the broad bosom of the son of god oh what a heart is this that doth not merely comprehend the persons of his people but comprehends also the diverse and innumerable concerns of all those persons dost thou think o christian that thou canst measure the love of christ think of what his love has brought thee justification adoption sanctification eternal life the riches of his goodness are unsearchable thou shalt never be able to tell them out or even conceive them o oh, the breath of the love of christ shall such a love as this have half our hearts shall it have a cold love in return shall jesus's marvelous loving-kindness and tender care meet with but faint response and tardy acknowledgment o oh, my soul tune thy harp to a glad song of thanksgiving go to thy rest rejoicing for thou art no desolate wanderer 
but a beloved child, watched over, cared for, supplied, and defended by the Lord. Morning, April 30th. And all the children of Israel murmured. Numbers 14, verse 2. There are murmurers among Christians now, as there were in the camp of Israel of old. There are those who, when the rod falls, cry out against the afflictive dispensation. They ask, Why am I thus afflicted? What have I done to be chastened in this manner? A word with thee, O murmurer. Why shouldest thou murmur against the dispensations of the heavenly Father? Can he treat thee more hardly than thou deservest? Consider what a rebel thou once wast, but he has pardoned thee. Surely, if he in his wisdom sees fit now to chasten thee, thou shouldest not complain. After all, art thou smitten as hardly as thy sins deserve? Consider the corruption which is in thy breast, and then wilt thou wonder that there needs so much of the rod to fetch it out? Weigh thyself, and discern how much dross is mingled with thy gold, and dost thou think the fire too hot to purge away so much dross as thou hast? Does not that proud, rebellious spirit of thine prove that thy heart is not thoroughly sanctified? Are not those murmuring words contrary to the holy, submissive nature of God's children? Is not the correction needed? But if thou wilt murmur against the chastening, take heed, for it will go hard with murmurers. God always chastises his children twice, if they do not bear the first stroke patiently. But no one thing, he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. All his corrections are sent in love, to purify thee, and to draw thee nearer to himself. Surely it must help thee to bear the chastening with resignation, if thou art able to recognize thy father's hand. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. Murmur not, as some of them also murmur, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Evening, April 30th. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. Psalm 139, verse 17. Divine omniscience affords no comfort to the ungodly mind but to the child of God it overflows with consolation. God is always thinking upon us, never turns aside his mind from us, has us always before his eyes, and this is precisely as we would have it, for it would be dreadful to exist for a moment beyond the observation of our Heavenly Father. His thoughts are always tender, loving, wise, prudent, far-reaching, and they bring to us countless benefits. Hence it is a choice delight to remember them. The Lord always did think upon his people, hence their election and the covenant of grace by which their salvation is secured. He always will think upon them, hence their final perseverance by which they shall be brought safely to their final rest. In all our wanderings the watchful glance of the eternal watcher is ever more fixed upon us. We never roam beyond the shepherd's eye. In our sorrows he observes us incessantly, and not a pang escapes him. In our toils he marks all our weariness, and writes in his book all the struggles of his faithful ones. These thoughts of the Lord encompass us in all our paths, and penetrate the innermost region of our being. Not a nerve or tissue, valve or vessel, of our bodily organization is uncared for. All the littles of our little world are thought upon by the great God. Dear reader, is this precious to you? Then hold to it. Never be led astray by those philosophic fools who preach up an impersonal God and talk of self-existent, self-governing matter. The Lord liveth and thinketh upon us. This is a truth far too precious for us to be lightly robbed of it. The notice of a nobleman is valued so highly that he who has it counts his fortune made. But what is it to be thought of by the king of kings? If the Lord thinketh upon us, all is well, and we may rejoice evermore. Morning, May 1st. 
His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. Song of Solomon, 5, verse 13. Lo, the flowery month is come. March winds and April showers have done their work, and the earth is all bedecked with beauty. Come, my soul, put on thine holiday attire, and go forth to gather garlands of heavenly thoughts. Thou knowest whither to betake thyself, for to thee the beds of spices are well known, and thou hast so often smelt the perfume of the sweet flowers, that thou wilt go at once to thy well-beloved, and find all loveliness, all joy in him. That cheek, once so rudely smitten with a rod, oft bedewed with tears of sympathy and then defiled with spittle that cheek as it smiles with mercy is as fragrant aromatic to my heart thou didst not hide thy face from shame and spitting o lord jesus and therefore i will find my dearest delight in praising thee those cheeks were furrowed by the plough of grief and crimsoned with red lines of blood from thy thorn-crowned temples such marks of love unbounded cannot but charm my soul far more than pillars of perfume if i may not see the whole of his face i would behold his cheeks for the least glimpse of him is exceedingly refreshing to my spiritual sense and yields a variety of delights in jesus i find not only fragrance but a bed of spices not one flower but all manner of sweet flowers he is to me my rose and my lily, my heart's ease and my cluster of camphor. When he is with me it is May all the year round, and my soul goes forth to wash her happy face in the morning dew of his grace, and to solace herself with the singing of the birds of his promises. Precious Lord Jesus, let me in very deed know the blessedness which dwells in abiding unbroken fellowship with thee i am a poor worthless one whose cheek thou hast deigned to kiss oh let me kiss thee in return with the kisses of my lips evening may first i am the rose of sharon song of solomon two verse one whatever there may be of beauty in the material world Jesus Christ possesses all that in the spiritual world in a tenfold degree. Amongst flowers, the rose is deemed the sweetest, but Jesus is infinitely more beautiful in the garden of the soul than the rose can be in the gardens of earth. He takes the first place as the fairest among ten thousand. He is the sun, and all others are the stars. The heavens and the day are dark in comparison with him, for the king in his beauty transcends all. I am the rose of Sharon. This is the best and rarest of roses. Jesus is not the rose alone. He is the rose of Sharon, just as he calls his righteousness gold, and then adds the gold of Ophir, the best of the best. He is positively lovely, and superlatively the loveliest. There is variety in his charms, the rose is delightful to the eye, and its scent is pleasant and refreshing. So each of the senses of the soul, whether it be the taste or feeling, the hearing, the sight, or the spiritual smell, finds appropriate gratification in Jesus. Even the recollection of his love is sweet. Take the rose of Sharon and pull it leaf by leaf, and lay by the leaves in the jar of memory, and you shall find each leaf fragrant, long afterwards filling the house with perfume christ satisfies the highest taste of the most educated spirit to the very full the greatest amateur in perfumes is quite satisfied with the rose and when the soul has arrived at her highest pitch of true taste she shall still be content with christ nay she shall be the better able to appreciate him heaven itself possesses nothing which excels the rose of Sharon. What emblem can fully set forth his beauty? Human speech and earth-born things fail to tell of him. Earth's choicest charms commingled feebly picture his abounding preciousness. Blessed Rose, bloom in my heart forever. Morning, May 2nd. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. 
John 17, verse 15. It is a sweet and blessed event which will occur to all believers in God's own time, the going home to be with Jesus. In a few more years, the Lord's soldiers, who are now fighting the good fight of faith, will have done with conflict and have entered into the joy of their Lord. But although Christ prays that his people may eventually be with him where he is, he does not ask that they may be taken at once away from this world to heaven. He wishes them to stay here. Yet how frequently does the weary pilgrim put up the prayer, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly to be at rest. But Christ does not pray like this. He leaves us in his Father's hands until, like shocks of corn fully ripe, we shall each be gathered into our master's garner. Jesus does not plead for our instant removal by death, for to abide in the flesh is needful for others, if not profitable for ourselves. He asks that we may be kept from evil, but he never asks for us to be admitted to the inheritance in glory till we are of full age. Christians often want to die when they have any trouble. Ask them why, and they tell you, because we would be with the Lord. We fear it is not so much because they are longing to be with the Lord, as because they desire to get rid of their troubles, else they would feel the same wish to die at other times, when not under the pressure of trial. They want to go home, not so much for the Savior's company, as to be at rest. Now it is quite right to desire to depart if we can do it in the same spirit that Paul did because to be with Christ is far better. But the wish to escape from trouble is a selfish one. Rather, let your care and wish be to glorify God by your life here, as long as he pleases, even though it be in the midst of toil, in conflict, and suffering, and leave him to say when it is enough. Evening, May 2nd. These all died in faith. Hebrews 11. Verse 13. Behold the epitaph of all those blessed saints who fell asleep before the coming of our Lord. It matters nothing how else they died, whether of old age or by violent means. This one point in which they all agree is the most worthy of record. They all died in faith. In faith they lived. It was their comfort, their guide, their motive, and their support and in the same spiritual grace they died, ending their life song in the sweet strain in which they had so long continued. They did not die resting in the flesh or upon their own attainments. They made no advance from their first way of acceptance with God, but held to the way of faith to the end. Faith is as precious to die by as to live by. Dying in faith has distinct reference to the past. They believed the promises which had gone before and were assured that their sins were blotted out through the mercy of God. Dying in faith has to do with the present. These saints were confident of their acceptance with God. They enjoyed the beams of his love and rested in his faithfulness. Dying in faith looks into the future. They fell asleep, affirming that the Messiah would surely come and that when he would in the last days appear upon the earth, they would rise from their graves to behold him. To them the pains of death were but the birth pangs of a better state. Take courage, my soul, as thou readest this epitaph. Thy course, through grace, is one of faith, and sight seldom cheers thee. This has also been the pathway of the brightest and the best. Faith was the orbit in which these stars of the first magnitude moved all the time of their shining here and happy art thou that it is thine. Look anew tonight to Jesus, the author and finisher of thy faith, and thank him for giving thee like precious faith with souls now in glory. Morning, May 3rd. In the world ye shall have tribulation. John 16, verse 33. Art thou asking the reason of this, believer? Look upward to thy heavenly Father, and behold him pure and holy. Dost thou know that thou art one day to be like him? Wilt thou easily be conformed to his image? Wilt thou not require much refining in the furnace of affliction to purify thee? 
will it be an easy thing to get rid of thy corruptions and make thee perfect even as thy father which is in heaven is perfect next christian turn thine eye downward dost thou know what foes thou hast beneath thy feet thou wast once a servant of satan and no king will willingly lose his subject dost thou think that satan will let thee alone no he will be always at thee for he goeth about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour expect trouble therefore christian when thou lookest beneath thee then look around thee where art thou thou art in an enemy's country a stranger and a soldier the world is not thy friend if it be then thou art not god's friend for he who is the friend of the world is the enemy of god be assured that thou shalt find foemen everywhere when thou sleepest think that thou art resting on the battlefield when thou walkest suspect an ambush in every hedge as mosquitoes are said to bite strangers more than natives so will the trials of earth be sharpest to you lastly look within thee into thine own heart and observe what is there sin and self are still within ah if thou hast no devil to tempt thee no enemies to fight thee and no world to ensnare thee thou wouldst still find in thyself evil enough to be a sore trouble to thee for the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked expect trouble then but despond not on account of it for god is with thee to help and to strengthen thee he has said i will be with thee in trouble i will deliver thee and honor thee evening may third a very present help psalm forty six verse one covenant blessings are not meant to be looked at only but to be appropriated even our lord jesus is given to us for our present use believer thou dost not make use of christ as thou oughtest to do when thou art in trouble why dost thou not tell him all thy grief has he not a sympathizing heart and can he not comfort and relieve thee no thou art going about to all thy friends save the best friend and telling thy tale everywhere except into the bosom of thy lord art thou burdened with this day's sins here is a fountain filled with blood use it saint use it has a sense of guilt returned upon thee the pardoning grace of jesus may be proved again and again come to him at once for cleansing dost thou deplore thy weakness he is thy strength why not lean upon him dost thou feel naked come hither soul put on the robe of Jesus' righteousness stay not looking at it but wear it strip off thine own righteousness and thine own fears too put on the fair white linen for it was meant to wear dost thou feel thyself sick pull the night bell of prayer and call up the beloved physician he will give the cordial that will revive thee thou art poor but then thou hast a kinsman a mighty man of wealth what wilt thou not go to him and ask him to give thee of his abundance when he has given thee his promise that thou shalt be joint heirs with him and has made over all that he is and all that he has to be thine there is nothing christ dislikes more than for his people to make a show thing of him and not to use him he loves to be employed by us the more burdens we put on his shoulders the more precious will he be to us let us be simple with him then not backward stiff or cold as though our bethlehem could be what sinai was of old morning may fourth shall a man make gods unto himself and they are no gods jeremiah sixteen verse twenty one great besetting sin of ancient israel was idolatry and the spiritual israel are vexed with a tendency to the same folly where infant's star shines no longer and the women weep no more for tammuz but mammon still intrudes his golden calf and the shrines of pride are not forsaken self in various forms struggles to subdue the chosen ones under its dominion and the flesh sets up its altars wherever it can find space for them 
favorite children are often the cause of much sin in believers the lord is grieved when he sees us doting upon them above measure they will live to be as great a curse to us as absalom was to david or they will be taken from us to leave our homes desolate if christians desire to grow thorns to stuff their sleepless pillows let them dote on their dear ones it is truly said that they are no gods for the objects of our foolish love are very doubtful blessings the solace which they yield us now is very dangerous and the help which they can give us in the hour of trouble is little indeed why then are we so bewitched with vanities we pity the poor heathen who adore the god of stone and yet worship a god of gold where is the vast superiority between a god of flesh and one of wood the principle the sin the folly is the same in either case only that in ours the crime is more aggravated because we have more light and sin in the face of it the heathen bows to a false deity but the true god he has never known we commit two evils inasmuch as we forsake the living god and turn unto idols may the lord purge us from all this grievous iniquity the dearest idol i have known whate'er that idol be help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee evening may fourth being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible first peter one verse twenty three peter most earnestly exhorted the scattered saints to love each other with a pure heart fervently and he wisely fetched his argument not from the law from nature or from philosophy but from that high and divine nature which god hath implanted in his people just as some judicious tutor of princes might labor to beget and foster in them a kingly spirit and dignified behavior finding arguments in their position and descent so looking upon god's people as heirs of glory princes of the blood royal descendants of the king of kings earth's truest and oldest aristocracy peter saith to them see that ye love one another because of your noble birth being born of incorruptible seed because of your pedigree being descended from god the creator of all things and because of your immortal destiny for you shall never pass away though the glory of the flesh shall fade and even its existence shall cease it would be well if in the spirit of humility we recognized the true dignity of our regenerated nature and lived up to it what is a christian if you compare him with a king he adds priestly sanction to royal dignity the king's royalty often lieth only in his crown but with a christian it is infused into his inmost nature he is as much above his fellows through his new birth as a man is above the beast that perisheth surely he ought to carry himself in all his dealings as one who is not of the multitude but chosen out of the world distinguished by sovereign grace written among the peculiar people and who therefore cannot grovel in the dust as others nor live after the manner of the world's citizens let the dignity of your nature and the brightness of your prospects o believers in christ constrain you to cleave unto holiness and to avoid the very appearance of evil morning may fifth i will be their god and they shall be my people second corinthians six verse sixteen what a sweet title my people what a cheering revelation their god how much of meaning is couched in these two words my people here is a specialty the whole world is god's the heaven even the heaven of the heavens is the lord's and he reigneth among the children of men but of those whom he hath chosen whom he hath purchased to himself he saith what he saith not of others my people in this word there is the idea of proprietorship in a special manner the lord's portion is his people jacob is a lot of his inheritance all the nations upon earth are his the whole world is in his power yet are his people his chosen more especially his possession for he hath done more for them than others he has bought them with his blood 
he has brought them nigh to himself he has set his great heart upon them he has loved them with an everlasting love a love which many waters cannot quench and which the revolutions of time shall never suffice in the least degree to diminish dear friends can you by faith see yourselves in that number can you look up to heaven and say my lord and my god mine by that sweet relationship which entitles me to call thee father mine by that hallowed fellowship which i delight to hold with thee when thou art pleased to manifest thyself unto me as thou dost not unto the world canst thou read the book of inspiration and find there the indentures of thy salvation canst thou read thy title writ in precious blood canst thou by humble faith lay hold of jesus garments and say my christ if thou canst then god saith of thee and of others like thee my people for if god be your god and christ your christ the lord has a special peculiar favour of you you are the object of his choice accepted in his beloved son evening may fifth he that handleth a matter wisely shall find good and whoso trusteth in the lord happy is he proverb sixteen verse twenty wisdom is man's true strength and under its guidance he best accomplishes the end of his being wisely handling the matter of life gives to man the richest enjoyment and presents the noblest occupation for his powers hence by it he finds good in the fullest sense without wisdom man is as the wild ass's colt running hither and thither wasting strength which might be profitably employed wisdom is the compass by which man is to steer across the trackless waste of life without it he is a derelict vessel the sport of winds and waves a man must be prudent in such a world as this or he will find no good but be betrayed into unnumbered ills the pilgrim will sorely wound his feet among the briars of the wood of life if he does not pick his steps with the utmost caution he who is in the wilderness infested with robber bands must handle matters wisely if he would journey safely if trained by the great teacher we follow where he leads we shall find good even while in this dark abode there are celestial fruits to be gathered this side of eden's bowers and songs of paradise to be sung amid the groves of earth but where shall this wisdom be found many have dreamed of it but have not possessed it where shall we learn it let us listen to the voice of the lord for he hath declared the secret he hath revealed to the sons of men wherein true wisdom lieth and we have it in the text whoso trusteth in the lord happy is he the true way to handle a matter wisely is to trust in the lord this is a sure clue to the most intricate labyrinths of life follow it and find eternal bliss he who trusts in the lord has a diploma for wisdom granted by inspiration happy is he now and happier shall he be above lord in this sweet eventide walk with me in the garden and teach me the wisdom of faith End of April 29th through May 5th.